Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. Most people imagine that the inner kingdom, as Jesus described it, lacks the fascination they attribute to sense life, the bright lights, the diverse attractions, the joys, and the laughter. Little do they realize what a vast universe exists in their own selves. There are many passages in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible that describe aspects of this inner kingdom. In the book of Genesis, we read, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This garden was in no earthly place. It exists even now in the very self of every human being. The legend of Adam and Eve is allegorical. It describes how the first human beings dissipated their spiritual energy centered in the spine. The spine is the channel through which flows the river of baptism and of spiritual life. The Bhagavad Gita tells us the wise speak of an eternal Ashvata tree with its roots above and its branches below. The tree of life spoken of also in Genesis is the spine. Its roots are above in the brain's energy. Its branches are outward, spreading into the nervous system. When the sap, which is to say the energy, flows downward, the consciousness is drawn into delusion. On the other hand, when the energy is drawn upward in deep meditation, the consciousness is drawn toward its eternal source, God, and is at last united with him. Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita, therefore urges his chief disciple Arjuna to embrace the yoga science, the path of meditation. The yogi, he says, is greater than the ascetic, greater even than the followers of the path of wisdom, of jnana yoga, or of the action yoga, karma yoga. Be thou, O Arjuna, a yogi. For those who would find the divine truth, Krishna gives this description of the yogi. Steadfast, a lamp burns, sheltered from the wind. Steadfastly meditating, solitary. Such is the likeness of the yogi's mind, shut from sense storms and burning bright to heaven. Thus, through holy scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Morning, everyone. This subject, the inner kingdom, is pretty central to our spiritual practices. And uh, someone sent me a little insight about the inner kingdom through Jewish Buddhism, they called it. <laughs> they said that inside of us we have 10,000 flowers. And those flowers blossom 10,000 times. And each blossom has 10,000 petals. And so you might need a specialist. <laughs> and we do need a specialist <laughs> to help us get to the inner kingdom. Christ asked Babaji to send a great one to the West to reawaken and show the underlying similarities of the teachings of Christ and the teachings of Krishna. And Babaji sent Yogananda, whose teachings we practice here. And he showed not only the underlying similarities, but he brought powerful techniques that can help us to experience that inner kingdom, each and every one of us for ourselves and have a direct experience of God 
within us. The kingdom of heaven is within, east and west. And so meditation is a tool. It's not an end in itself. It's only a tool. It's techniques. It's a little bit like if you have a a jar that's full of water, and it also has some dirt in it. And you shake it up, and it's cloudy. You can't see through it. But then if you set it down, and you let it sit still for a while, the dirt begins to settle, and the water becomes clear again. And that's what meditation does for us. It helps us to become clear again and be able to see and experience that kingdom of heaven, that divine presence, that inner kingdom within us. But we all know that this world that we live in, whether it's east, west, north, or south, we are just not in any way supported in stillness. It's all about sound bites. It's all about restless thoughts and feelings and emotions. I come from a culture where the higher the emotions are, the more you prove that you're alive. You know, just sort of the direct opposite of the experience of stillness that we're trying to achieve. Yogananda himself tells a story about um, when he was a young man, he had the idea that it would be lovely to raise some funds, and he was a very good fundraiser, to raise some funds and with his friends and to buy food and to cook a meal for the poor and feed the poor. And so he did that, and he worked all day long, all night long. They cooked and cooked and cooked, and they fed people throughout the day, poor people who came, hundreds of them, and late into the evening. And then they cleaned up. And finally, when, you know, after all of that, he was finished very, very late into the night, he said, God will surely understand that I'm tired and I won't meditate tonight. I'll go to sleep. And he said he lay down on his bed. And then he heard the honeyed tongue of Satan speak to him and say, oh, you poor boy, you worked so hard. You must sleep. You need your rest. And he said he just sat up with determination, and he did his kriya, and then he went into ecstasy. And he stayed in that position in ecstasy all night long. He used to call sleep counterfeit samadhi, you know. And so we just battle with that all the time. We think we need all of these comforts. And he was just saying, you know, we need to break through that because the world doesn't support it. We have to sort of go in against that, lean into it, and do our practices because you sort of need to be able to sit long enough for the dirt to settle and the clarity to come. It, there's another story of uh, his, one of his direct disciples, Dr. Lewis and his wife. They were both direct disciples. They went on a vacation with Yogananda, and they had a long day of travel. And they arrived at a hotel and checked in, and Mrs. Lewis especially was exhausted. And so they... Um, ended up getting adjoining rooms in the hotel. And they couldn't help but notice that Yogananda opened the door <laughs> of the adjoining <laughs> room between them. The door was open. And they turned their light off. And Mrs. Lewis, they both went to bed. And then after a few minutes, they heard sub gum, which was the name of a dish they'd had for lunch that day in a Chinese restaurant. And Mr. Lewis sort of chuckled, and a few minutes later they heard, super sub gum. <laughs> and he just said his wife 
turned and faced the wall. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. And then after a few minutes, super submarine sub gum. And at that point, they just roared into laughter. And they went into the room and sat with Yogananda on the bed. And they talked for a while. And then they started talking about God. And then they meditated all through the night. And I had a little echo of that experience myself with Swami Kriyananda, Ananda's founder and Yogananda's direct disciple. Years ago, after Riman and I had been asked to come to Seattle, uh, but early on, Swamiji invited me back for some meetings around the publishing, which I used to do at Ananda Village. And um, I was a guest at the Crystal Hermitage in the guest room, which was right above his office. And I had my meetings, and I reported to him in the evening, and we visit a little bit. And then I went up to my room to go to bed, and he started writing. You know, he would work late into the night. It was about 10 o'clock at that point, so I meditated, got on my nighty, got into bed. And then the intercom, which was connected to his apartment, and his office and all through, every room had one. He buzzed into the intercom in my room and he said, Padma, can you come down for a few minutes? I have something I want to show you. So I put my clothes back on and I go down. And he had written you know, a number of pages in his book. He wrote really quickly. And he asked me to read them and to give him feedback. So I did that. And that took a little while, and I went back upstairs when I was done and said good night, put on my nightie, got back into bed, closed my eyes. Padma, <laughs> can you come down? I have a little more. <laughs> that happened three times. <laughs> Dressing and undressing. It was, th you know, after two in the morning before I finally got to stay in bed. But I know, you know, he was just trying to show me. We have energy. And mind you, you know, he stayed up after that. And then at 5 in the morning, I could hear him get up again and go into his meditation room. We have, Yogananda said we have more energy in the tip of our finger than it takes to light the city of Chicago for a week. You know, we have way more the divinity within us is bright and full of energy. And we just touch just the tip of the iceberg in our daily lives. Building community was a, an important aspect of what Swami Kriyananda tried to fulfill for Yogananda. And nine res, you know, intentional spiritual communities were in full swing at the time he left his body. But in the beginning, especially building that first one, it was hard work. And it took a lot of energy to create something out of nothing and something that was from the inside out that was full of spirit and also a practical and working way of life and community for us. And I remember he would give a Sunday service in that time frame somewhere, and he'd go, I could walk away from a community like this if God asked me to. It's not about anything on the outside. It's only about loving God and what is happening with us spiritually on the inside. That's all that really matters. And we think... You know, God's calling me to go here or to go there or to do this or to do that. But let's not fool ourselves. God's only calling us to go within. I was reflecting yesterday when I was thinking about this topic. We have Yoganandaji's family here. And uh, I was thinking about that first chapter 
in the autobiography where he talks about his early family life. And he talks about being from the Kshatriya caste in India, which is the warrior caste. And what that really means is those who are nobly serving humanity and willing to lay down their lives like a soldier to help uplift um, others. And I was thinking, now an avatar, how is it that an avatar is not in the priestly caste, a, a Brahmin? And then I reflected on Christ. He was born of a carpenter. And he wasn't born in a rabbi family. He wasn't born in the priestly caste. In fact, in part, he came to correct them. He was born to uplift the consciousness of common humanity at that time. And Yogananda was born in the time just right on the cusp between coming out of an age of institutionalism, Kali Yuga, dogmatism, rigidity, into the age of Dwapara, the age of energy, the age of the atomic age, it's sometimes called, here in the West. And it took a warrior, it took a general, to sort of shake us through the rigidity of institutionalism and, and uh, dogmatism into the fresh air of energy and the understanding that everything is divine and that divinity begins, it's a reflection of what resides inside of us. He came to show us the way to the inner kingdom. And not only did it take a general to do that, but we need to be warriors in order to be able to experience that. Bless you. Let's listen to these words from Yogananda's Whispers from Eternity. My allotted plot of consciousness was small. Carelessly, I let it grow barren. It produced no crops of inner life-sustaining culture. Now the bleak winter of dead opportunities approaches with its pall of unproductivity. My lot is small and my life season is short, yet now I would produce a mighty harvest. I will expand my kingdom of willpower. To do so, I must conquer new states of consciousness, enlarge my achievements, and outgrow in consciousness every limiting horizon. But, O oh, Father Divine, there are billions of my hungry thought families and their little ones to feed. And for them, I need a big harvest during this short season of my earth life. The irrigating waters of my craving many times grew dry while my soil of inner culture was left undeveloped. Now I will work all the harder using the machinery of scientific technique in my search for thee. O oh, divine sower, with thine unseen hand, Throw thy living seeds of inspiration into the cultivated furrows of my awakened resolution. In this short remaining season of my earth life, let me reap the largest harvest of all, thy cosmic vision. <laughs>